Every data analyst needs to know one BI tool, whether it be Tableau, Power BI, Spotfire, Looker, the list goes on and on. But one thing is clear, you need to know some sort of BI tool to become a data analyst. So in this video, I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to teach you how to learn Power BI as fast as humanly possible using a simple acronym, which is FAST, which stands for Fetch, Arrange, Shape, and Tell. I want both of us to promise each other something by the end of this video. I want to promise you that by the end of this video, you're going to have amazing Power BI projects you can actually showcase to employers and the world. And I want you to make a promise to me that you're not just going to watch this video and not take any action. I actually am going to be giving you guidance on what to do, and maybe you can even follow along with me as I teach you how to learn Power BI as fast as possible. Lucky for you, Power BI is completely free to use. Microsoft actually offers it for free on Power BI Desktop Cloud. So feel free to pause this video now and actually download it and resume this video once you have it downloaded. So so in case by now, if you aren't sold about why Power BI, let me give you some stats right now. 100,000 businesses around the world use Power BI. Yes, that's 100,000 businesses. It is used in over 200 countries with millions of active users every single month. Not to mention how integrated it is. It integrates with over 500 different partners. So if you're still deciding whether this is the BI tool you want to start with, I can tell you right now, you will not go wrong learning Power BI first. If you're new to this channel, my name is Rohan. I've been in data science and analytics for the past couple of years now. I started my career at a startup, then moved to Wall Street, and finally a Silicon Valley-based tech company where I worked in data science. And now we do more freelancing for small to mid-sized companies. We've worked with e-commerce companies, marketing agencies, and law firms. I also run a data analytics bootcamp on the side to actually help you land your first data analyst role. Now, this video sponsor is DataCamp. And before you stop me right now, you might know on this channel, I absolutely have a disdain for a lot of courses on the internet. And the reason for that is because they are kind of a feedback loop for constantly watching someone do something rather than doing. I give this example all the time. When it comes to driving a car, you actually need to actually drive the car rather than just watch a ton of videos on someone driving the car, right? The same goes with anything technical when it comes to learning software engineering, data science, and data analytics. You actually need to be practicing the tool you're learning. And the reason why I like Data Camp is because you can actually practice bite sized exercises after every every single lesson. I was actually shocked when DataCamp reached out to me and I, I've never used this course before, but I've used DataCamp while starting my career in data analytics. I specifically took the Python and the SQL course back in the day, and I don't think they had the Power BI course at this point. So when I actually went into DataCamp and I was just exploring this tool, I was shocked. It has Power BI actually in the platform integrated itself where you don't have to waste your time downloading it. You can actually practice it in the tool and it kind of guides you through it as the data sets loaded in. So you can just focus on learning the tool and practicing the tool rather than spending a ton of time downloading softwares and troubleshooting admin. So if you want to learn Power BI as fast as possible without wasting time downloading data sets, crafting your own little exercises, I highly recommend Data Camp's Power BI course. I ended up taking it for this video and just going through it and quite honestly, I can get behind it. I'm very selective on who I take for sponsors for this channel. So when I do sponsor something, I highly, highly recommend that you use it. If you are going to use it, I'm going to leave my link down below. Please use my link and let me know how it is in the comments. Now, the first part of the acronym to learning Power BI or any BI tool for that matter is F, which stands for fetch. Any dashboard or any analysis needs data. Data is quite literally the oxygen behind data analysis. The point I want to get to you is businesses don't care about code. They care about their questions. They're drowning in tons of questions. Which product is gonna be performing the best? Which product should we keep next year for an e-commerce company? So all these businesses are drowning in tons of questions and data and code are just a tool to get the job done. So in order to have a robust analysis, you must fetch accurate and a lot of data. And these BI tools and reporting tools like Tableau, Power BI, Looker all become monitors towards how the company performs to answer these questions. So when it comes down to recruiters and hiring managers, they actually want to see examples on practice projects you've done. So I highly recommend actually doing projects with the Power BI or Tableau or whatever BI tool you choose to do. So every other step after this can't be done the cleaning, the pre-processing, the actual visualization, they can't be done if you don't have accurate and clean data. I want to tell you a story. Back when I was first getting started with my career, I used to spend weeks, if not months, on these really large scale analysis. And I would spend all this time, I'd present it to stakeholders and my analysis was wrong. Not because my actual methodology is wrong or my code is wrong, it's because the data I was referencing was outdated. It wasn't updated. So any recommendations I gave to my stakeholders didn't apply. So there's nothing worse than spending all that time crafting a methodology, spending all that time on analysis if you don't have proper data. So the assignment I want you to do is pick one messy real world business centered data set for this video. I highly recommend going on Google data sets and finding some niche or industry that you're particularly interested in or passionate about that you're currently applying to and actually fetching this data. Now, the next step, once you actually have your data, it's time for you to actually import it into Power BI. 
BI, whether you have a CSV file, Excel file, or you even want to connect to SQL database, Power BI can accommodate all of these different needs. Now, once you have it actually imported, it's very rare that the data is just ready to go for analysis. You actually need to arrange. The A in FAST stands for arrange, so you can actually clean and pre-process your data. There's a one liner I like to tell new analysts all the time, clean now and cry never. If you have your data cleaned and pre-processed, you will not be wasting your time later down the line when you're like, oh, why is this thing blank? Why are the numbers not adding up? It's very, very important that you actually spend your time cleaning and processing your data. Now, the three non-negotiables that you need to do when coming to cleaning and pre-processing is one, removing empty columns and rows. There's nothing worse than having a ton of blank rows just slowing down your queries and slowing down your analysis. Two, make sure you're naming things with a purpose. It is so common to me when I go to new companies and especially older legacy companies, the data sets are all all labeled wrong. There's something the software engineer named maybe five or 10 years ago that no one bothered to rename that isn't even intuitive. So I highly recommend whatever data set you get, whether you're at a company or doing your project right now, rename it so it makes sense towards you and your stakeholders, please. And finally, make sure the data types are ready for your structure. I see this all the time where I see a number data type actually as a text, which actually doesn't compile. So when I do like a calculated field, calculated field for those of you who don't know, means you're taking two different columns and you're making a calculation. You can be adding it or subtracting it. The problem is if this calculated field is using two text columns, it won't actually work. So you need to make sure the data types are correct when it comes to date, time, numbers, or even text. So the challenge I have for you is I want you to actually delete the blanks. I want you to rename columns and actually set accurate data types. Now, the third component of FAST is called shape. This is more of the back end of Power BI or any data modeling, but they're really two different types of shapes. In, in data analysis and, and data warehouses, there are a bunch of different tables. Not all of them are actually containing data. Some could be fact tables, and then some could be dimension tables, which are more supplemental to the fact tables. So the most common schemas that you'll see in most companies I've worked with use the star schema. So the star schema is pretty simple. It just denormalizes the database structure where a central fact table is connected to multiple different dimension tables, kind of like a star. A snowflake schema pretty much extends the star schema by further normalizing dimension tables into sub-dimension tables, creating a more complex hierarchical structure. Some examples I like to give is if you imagine a grocery store sales data, you might have a central sales table, which could be the fact table in this case, that stores the sales transactions. You will also have dimension tables like customers, products, and dates to provide more context about each one of these sales. So the sales table would likely link to each of these dimension tables using primary keys like customer ID, product ID, and date key. The Snowflake scheme, on the other hand, instead of a single customer's table, you might have customers, customer addresses, customer demographics, and the sales table would link to customers, which in turn would link to customer addresses and customer demographics. So it's pretty much like a chain. I won't go into too much detail on the key differences between these, but there are plenty of videos online explaining these. So before you dive into any visualization whatsoever, I highly, highly recommend you spend time actually modeling the data so it actually makes sense. So the visuals are accurate. It's pretty much like hanging a chandelier in your house, like the big light thing without actually having the proper wiring done first. It wouldn't light up, right? Or it wouldn't work well. So really spend time data modeling and making sure that arranging your data so it makes sense before actually visualizing and making your dashboard. So you may not need to do this, but if you do have multiple different tables for this challenge, I want you to actually drop your fact and your dimension tables into a star and make sure it's ready to go for an analysis. Now, the last part of fast is called tell. And this is what I like to call when you turn raw data into takeaways that your stakeholders can actually act on. At the end of the day, dashboards will not get you paid. It's the stories that come with dashboards that get you paid and make the business make right decisions. This is coming from someone who's literally made C-suite level dashboards. Like my dashboards were in the top 5% of usage at the companies I've worked at, one of the companies. I can tell you from firsthand, the C-suite will look at your dashboard for 15 seconds. They'll try to figure out a decision. If there's no decision or it doesn't make sense or not intuitive, they will click out immediately. 99% of dashboards at these companies don't get used at all. And you don't want your dashboard you're spending weeks, if not months on to not get usage, right? So you want to use visual hierarchy and actually use visuals with a purpose. There's a great book on this called Storytelling with Data that I highly recommend to learning how to visualize data and tell a story with your dashboard. Look, some dashboards are pretty self-serving, but you still have to do some visual hierarchy, right? You can't just put random visuals together and, and hope your end stakeholder knows how to use it. So there's pretty much three visuals that you always almost have to do for every dashboard. And one is being the card. Card is pretty much like your high level KPI, like how much are the total sales? How much is the total profit that your exact or your stakeholder can just see and know 
immediately. It should pretty much be like a one glance pulse check, like your Apple Watch when you check your heart rate when you're working out, or it could be your blood pressure, just pretty much a high level number that needs to be told to your stakeholder. Two, I like to use bar charts a lot. You can use histograms, whatever, whatever you really want. This is good for categories and maybe even sales just to visualize it. Basically, this allows you to immediately focus on the winners and losers. One thing I do want you to do is do not overcrowd your bar charts ever. It's very common where I'll see like a hundred different bars on one chart that you then you can't have any takeaways. So I highly recommend just keeping it to five, maybe or 10, depending on your visual size. And you can just remove like the trailing ones if you want. It really just depends. And finally, I always include line charts on my dashboards. Uh, by the way, this isn't a blanket statement saying you need to do it, but this is just from my own experience. Line charts are great for just showing performance over time. So sales over time, over a look back period, and you can always include a slicer or a date period at the top. So this is just to showcase to execs, are you climbing, are you coasting, or are you actually going down in your sales or revenue over time? So the challenge I have for you is actually make visuals from the data you've actually modeled this far and actually record a loom about why you use that visual, what it's actually showing to stakeholders and what the takeaway is. You can actually post this on LinkedIn and you can tag me in this post and I will be personally reviewing all of these and I'll give you a comment on what I think about it. Just to recap, everything we've gotten so far. F stands for fetch. You need to actually have clean data and you need to have sourced the right data for your analysis. Otherwise, no other step after this matters. The next is A, which is arrange. You want to actually process your data. You want to clean it. You need to make sure it's ready for the analysis you're about to do. S stands for shape. You want to make sure it's in a star where you have one fact and multiple dimensions connected to it. And T stands for tell. You actually want to showcase your analysis and showcase your visuals and actually tell a story of what you're doing. So if you want extra practice, if you want all the data sets loaded in for you and you want to just get started right away, I highly recommend Data Camp's course. I'm going to leave the link down below so you can join and make sure to post on LinkedIn when you are done with this exercise and I'll be personally reviewing it. As always, I wish you the best and you'll have amazing dashboards.